Hi, I'm Hamza. I'm a research scientist at Google. Uh, I work on at the intersection of NLP and uh, data privacy. And yeah, I'm joined today um, with Isabel by Isabel. Um, so would you like to go ahead, Isabel? You... Uh, yeah, I'm I'm Isabel. I am a research scientist with Amazon and um, working on uh, natural language generation and uh, on semantic parsing. Um, so uh, we're going to kind of uh, tag team the, the presentation today. Um, so we'll, we'll switch between the two of us, um, hopefully relatively seamlessly, but, but we'll see. Um, so um, we'll just get our, our slides up. Um, should I, or you, you want to go ahead? Uh, do you want to start with them, Hamza? And then... Um, okay. Um, one second. So it's asking me to quit and reopen Zoom to share my screen. Do you have? Uh, maybe I'll do mine then. <laughs> Let's do mine. Let's see. And now it works if you want. Okay, go ahead. Then All right. Is that, is that showing up okay? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as Seth said, um, we're uh, talking about some work today that we um, did, Hamza and I did with a colleague, Amir. Um, and this is work uh, that was um, published at the uh, end of last year at, at Coding. Um, and yeah, we're, we're happy to, to share it with you today. So, um, Starting off, I'll, I'll introduce the task for, for anyone who's not familiar with, um, with this, this problem. So in data to text, um, what, we're, what we're trying to do is, is transform some form of structured data into text in, in uh, the chosen language. So in this example that you can see, um, that, that chosen language is English, and we have a collection of um, four pieces of information about Michelle Obama that we would like to, to convey. So that could be, this structured data could be um, key value pairs, it could be um, some, some, a table of data, it could be a knowledge graph and um, some form of, of structured data um, that we want to, to transform into sentences and paragraphs. Um, and those sentences and paragraphs should then be um, uh, readable and, and listenable uh, depending where they're gonna be used. Um, so to see that in a different format, um, that could look something more like this, that we have data of some triples, so um, a, a subject, a predicate, and an object that we want to convey, um, and the text uh, for that. So we could have a different sort of meaning representation that, that this data is encoded in, um, but we, we always want to, to generate text from it. In terms of um, applications, why, why might we want to, to generate text from structured data? Um, there, there are lots of applications where um, we, we encounter this. Um, so one is in, in something like a weather forecast, and um, we might have information about the temperature now, the temperature later, and what the wind's gonna be. I'm in the UK, so probably something about rain. Um, and we want to uh, create there a text that's um, easy to, to, to consume. So rather than having to read through the, the, the table, maybe I just want a, a summary I can read. Um, and there's also um, a variety of applications that, that have been researched. There are uh, um, some examples here, uh, like encouraging safer driving. So um, in this study, the, the, the data is um, your personal data about your driving um, and trying to generate a text that, that encourages you to, to drive more safely. And um, so of course that means it's personalized and we, we aren't gonna be writing these all by hand for every single uh, user of the system. And similarly, we might have applications in, in product descriptions and in medical information that's summarizing um, charts or data for, for doctors or nurses to use. Um, summarizing stock market changes um, or, or air quality, or um, I'm sure you can imagine more cases where you might have some structured data that, that you could um, convey in a, in a text format. But whatever that, whatever that application is, um, we always want high fluency and high semantic fidelity. So uh, on the first slide, we had this mention of um, semantic fidelity. What do we mean by that? So um, here are uh, two example texts 
um, that hypothetically could be generated by a data to text system given this input. So our input here, our data is a collection of um, triples about Michelle Obama. And we have two texts um, that could be generated. So this first one, um, Michelle Obama is the author of The Coming. Michelle Obama was born in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Michelle Obama was educated at Princeton University. Michelle Obama was educated at Harvard University. So this one has uh, high semantic fidelity. It conveys all the information that was in those triples, um, but it has low fluency. So it, it's pretty repetitive between all of these, um, these sentences. And uh, it's, it's kind of not something that we would imagine a, um, a, a professional writer would, would create. Um, so the fluency could be improved on this one. Looking at the second one, born in Chicago, Illinois, and educated at Harvard, Michelle Obama is the author of A Promised Land. So this one we could say has high fluency, and um, it, it sounds pretty natural, um, but it isn't faithful to the original data. So we have missed out um, that uh, she studied at Princeton University and the, the book um, is, is incorrect. So um, what, we, what we want when we're generating text is for them to be um, both fluent and um, faithful to the, to the input text. So uh, let me hand over to Hamza. Um, Hamza, do you want me to go through the slides or do you want to take over a screen share? Um, I will screen share. Right. If, you can, if you stop the screen share, I will go ahead. I will stop. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Isabel. So um, we have two approaches in general when we are tackling the problem of um, data to text generation. The first one is like the end-to-end -end approaches and the second um, type of approaches is the pipeline approach. So we start with the pipeline-based approach. Um, given data such, uh, such as this example, uh, similar to the example we have seen before, um, we want to make like create a text from this data so this data here is represented as triplets. So we have like AC, um, uh, Chesina, and then the manager is Massimo Drago. And this is like relationship between the two. And then we have like Massimo Drago is a um, is is um, related to the club Calcio Catania, and um, Massimo is also related to the club Potenza Calcio. So these are relations, and we want to make sense of these into. To, to create text. So the first uh, step usually in the pipeline-based approach is data ordering, where we order the sentences into, so, so order the triplets into the order we wanna have them in the text. The second step is sentence structuring. So for example, we say that the first two relations compose the first sentence and the last relation composes the last sentence. Next, um, we go into lexicalization. So here, like Massimo Drago is called entity one, and then um, play is the um, is the corresponding um, term, like or play for is the corresponding term here for the club. Um, and entity two here is Calcio Catania, etc. Like we create um, as a um, sentence, or not really the final sentence but um, um, some text that represents these entities and, uh, and the relations. Next, re referring expression generation is where we go from um, having the entities as entity one, entity two into like the actual entities. And finally, textual realization is where we have um, the, the actual like verb verb phrases replaced with like the correct tense, etc. Now the advantage of such a pipeline based approach is that it has better generalization. It has been shown to have better generalization in the literature, like at, at least until 2018. Uh, like there were papers that show, okay, it's clear that we cannot reach the same level of generalization. However, the main disadvantage is the maintainability. So we have to set up training data for each step. If the step is based on machine learning or you have to create through 
this is, this is a problem. Um, the, the second issue is that you have um, error propagation happening across these steps. Um, so because a step can occur at each, uh, an error can occur at each step of the pipeline. Then we have um, the end-to-end -end approaches on the other hand, um, enjoy the ease of creation of parallel training data. That is, we just need the text and the um, output, the data and the output text. On the other hand, there's the difficulty of guaranteeing semantic fidelity. That is, semantic fidelity of the text um, is tricky to get when you have this um, the end-to-end -end approaches that were existing before. And finally, you could imagine that if you have an infinite amount of names that you can have in text um, represented, like representing represented in relations, in relations, then you have a very very sparse input and output spaces. So it's tricky to get these. Um, to, to, to overcome these. So we tackled the better generalization by leveraging better pre-trained language model. We, we try to match that in the end-to-end -end approaches. Um, we tackled the issue of semantic fidelity by building semantic fidelity classifiers. Um, we mitigate the problem of sparse input and output using what we call fine-grained state embeddings that we will come to later. So data tuner, um, which is the system we, we have built, um, has the following architecture. We proceed in two steps. The first step is generation, and the second step is re-ranking. So generation is given the text data, which is here like um, represented by di and ti, um, we built a data to text um, language model that outputs candidate texts. So text one, text two, text three rank by their uh, likelihood. Next, we have, um, so just to mention that this is the model which, which where we add the better language model and the fine grained state embeddings. Now, we also created like um, synthetic training data um, via rules that we created so that we can train the semantic fidelity classifier. That classifier would differentiate between accurate text and inaccurate text that that uh, data text language model has generated. Then we train this model and we use it to re-rank the selected, um, the generated candidates, surfacing the accurate one. So text three here is like the accurate one, it becomes the top one. We can also know in this case when we don't have any accurate text so that like the output is not usable. Um, so just to a brief like um, here, like definition of language model that we are using, so we are using the language model, what are called like the autoregressive language models, where um, the model aims to learn um, how to assign probabilities to sequences of symbols. So for example, here, where are we is the input or like the context and like the, let's say the most likely word um, according to a good language model, let's say is like going. And um, the more likely, that a sequence is, is, is to exist in that language distribution, the higher the probability is. So we have seen all, all like before like these language models in action where like um, GPT-2, for example, has shown um, a good performance in generating like um, in generating text in general. So we, in this work, we are working on a different problem, but it benefits from this ability to generate like fluent text, which is um, data text gen generation. But we adapt this to our use case where we have data instead of like just generating free form text. So how our um, data looks like, um, we have a few data sets. So they range from like, um, meaning graph-based meaning representation. So like here, graph-based meaning representation is like a web NLG where we have relations um, you could use to, to create a graph if you want. 
and these relations are um, can be there can be multiple relations and here there's like a subject and then the predicate is that or like the relation name leader name here and then the object is um, the object of the relation and the output here the leader of our house is Jacob uh, Bunskart. You would see here linearized B, which is linearized data. So as we will see later, everything we transform into text. So even the data we linearize into text. So here, like we just add certain like special tokens for, um, for some important items, like here subject or predicate or object, but the rest is like just, just text. Similarly, we use other data sets such as um, the LDC 2017 T10 data set, which comes from news and chats. And here we have like a more complex meaning representation. So it's like, um, like here the text output is the United States responded to that development with swift combination. And then here in the, um, the data, you would see like here the United States and then develop and then uh, condemn and um, et cetera. So, we, it's a, it's usually a harder task in a, in a way where we can like um, convert the data into a, just a linearized form here. And um, then, yeah, we have the text. Next, we have the E2E data set. So there we have um, uh, the clean E2E data set, which was clean to remove like this presence of semantically inaccurate outputs or semantically inconsistent outputs. So we have like here the restaurant domain, um, I think in Cambridge, Cambridge, UK. And we have here like, um, like data such as the name um, of the restaurant and like, or, or the coffee shop here and like the type and the area. And then you can find the coffee shop names easy in the Riverside area. And finally, the Vigo data set where the output is what's your favorite game that EA Canada has made and the input is like, um, like request, which is uh, what's the, et cetera. And developer is EA Canada and specifier favor. So this gives you an idea of like the diversity of data to text data sets that, that already exists there and that we use in this work to, to, to showcase our model. Um, so we start with a data to text language model um, in more details. So, as I said before, everything we cast like, as a language modeling problem. So our data is actually linearized into text. We just add data token at the beginning and text token before the text. Then this data is converted into tokens like um, GPT-2 tokenizer um, works on the subword level. So like probably some of these words will be converted into like smaller um, uh, tokens. And then the positional embeddings to represent the position of the token and then we have the state embeddings um, the state embeddings are something that we introduced in this work to help the model solve the, like mitigate the sparsity of the also indirectly the output so for example here um, um, if you take the like the republic of ireland um, this is or republic of ireland here we have like a single like um, uh, state here, um, which is the state of the object. And um, we take in general the token ID of the state as the token of the preceding special um, um, special special token. So object, predicate, subject are special tokens. Everything that comes after them has the same uh, state. Now for text, we just have the text state. And then we pass these um, um, summed embeddings into a causal transformer decoder. Here in this, in this work, we use GPT-2. And then we obtain, um, we, we train the model to generate the text. So one thing to note is that we compute the loss when we train the model only on the text and not on the data, because we want to learn the um, text um, and not the data. The model does not, we don't want the model to learn how to create good data because the, the data will already be given. We just want the model to learn how to generate text that matches this data. 
Okay, so this is the language model for data to text. Um, then we have the semantic fidelity classifier. So the semantic fidelity classifier um, classifies data to text tuples into accurate or hallucination or repetition, omission or value errors. So um, we have data and we have text here. We just also convert everything to text in the same way we converted the um, original like data to, and text to the language model format. The only difference is that here we don't have the state embeddings. We have token embeddings, positional embeddings, but just segment embeddings, or the coarse grain segment embeddings where the data is tagged with a different token from the, from the text. Then we pass these into a classification model, which is also a pre-trained language model, um, um, which is Roberta here, and, and, and pre-trained encoder in this case. And the output hidden layers um, are then um, passed into a classification classification head, um, and then the fidelity label would be um, giving us, is it accurate hallucination, repetition, etc. So um, then the synthetic data that we create for this model is as follows. So we have the data and uh, we have um, the text, right? So here the data is confirm um, that FIFA 12 has multiplayer, um, like, and then platforms Nintendo, and FIFA 12 on Nintendo has multiplayer, if that's the one you're talking about, is it? So that's like confirmation part. So the accurate data and text tuple is the given, generated by just randomly sampling another sentence from the, um, from the data set and adding it here. So we add, do you generally like first person in the adventure games? For repetition, we randomly select a sentence from this text and we repeat it. Like here, we repeat the only sentence, uh, the first sentence, sorry. And um, omission, we omit in this case. And for value error, um, we um, we have the data and text here, and um, we select an, an attribute from the data, which is FIFA 12 and Nintendo, and we flip them. So Nintendo on FIFA 12, it becomes the output. So all of these are automatically generated. The motivation is that we don't want to have new data labeled uh, in order to create this, um, this data, this, 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 this model. We want to get that um, semantic fidelity checks for free. And that's important for us. Sorry, we trained the model using this, this data. And um, the performance of this model on the validation set was like 97 to 98%. So this means that the model is able to learn this problem, at least on the validation set. However, whether this works in, like on the um, actual like when judged by humans is something that we will determine later in our experiments. So I'll pass it to Isabel so that um, you can continue on the experiments. Do you want to share your screen, Isabel? Uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take it back. Thanks. All right, is that sharing? Uh, great. So, um, as as Hamza said, um, we we then conducted some experiments with this with this setup, um, and there are three uh, different variants that we use of the data tuner setup um, as as uh, ablation studies. Um, so we have this no FC no FS version, um, which has um, is is the fine tuned language model with just a, a data and text um, a special token and without those those fine grained state embeddings that, that Hamza just described. Then our second version adds those in, and um, so so marking the subject, the predicate, the object uh, in those examples, and um, and then our third version is kind of the, the full picture, and um, with the semantic fidelity classifier as well. Uh, and in our experiments, we we compare with um, what was at least at the time the the, the 
um, state of the art uh, approaches to for each of the data sets. Um, and uh, as, as mentioned, we're using GPT-2 um, uh, for, for the generating um, language model um, and Roberta as, as well at a large. So uh, starting off by looking at some of the automated uh, metrics. Um, so for, for those not familiar with um, these, these metrics at the top there, Blue, Meteor, Rouge uh, and Cider, um, I won't go into them in, in great detail now, but just to say that they are um, metrics that are comparing a generated text um, to a reference. So um, we have a, 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 an example written by a human and, and we're comparing what, what was generated against that. Um, they have different variations in how they handle um, subsequences and, and engrams, but um, broadly, higher numbers are better. Um, it, that's, the, that's the simplest um, summary of them. So looking at those, um, we can see that from just the, 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 the plainest version of, of data tuner, we, we get some um, improvements in, in performance compared to the, um, the, the uh, prior approaches to this. Um, and that's um, also particularly interesting in that some of those um, approaches were uh, optimized to the particular um, data sets that they were looking at, the particular meaning representation. Um, so the um, approach to LDC uh, 2017 T10 by Zeratel um, is, is graph optimized um, to, to handle the AMR uh, graphs that, that that data set uses as its meaning representation. Um, so interesting that our uh, approach that, that doesn't have to be so tailored to the particular MR um, it performs, performs well. Uh, a second observation here is that the, this, these fine-grained state embeddings um, add an additional improvement um, in, in the highlighted rows there. And particularly um, in the uh, LDC 2017 dataset, um, which has this complex graph with lots of different states to keep track of, uh, we see improvement there. And a third observation from this set um, that we had was the uh, the, the classifier um, doesn't have a huge impact, um, if any, um, on, on these automated metrics. For some of them, there's a slight improvement, and for some there isn't, um, which, is, which is interesting, and we'll kind of come back to that in, in some of the human evaluation we did. And it, it also um, is worth noting that in the literature about uh, natural language generation and, and text generation, um, it, it's quite widely noted that automated metrics on their own um, but aren't, aren't sufficient indicator of semantic fidelity. They don't correlate very strongly with human judgments. Um, and there's, there's been some studies on that that, that show that um, the, the correlation isn't particularly reliable. So we'll get, we will come back to um, a, a, an alternative assessment of, of semantic fidelity later um, that we did to try and get a bit more insight into this. So for fluency, to see how fluent these, these texts are that we uh, can generate with data tuner. Um, we have a um, experiment comparing um, different texts uh, with uh, crowdsourced. So what, what do real people think of the text we've generated? And um, so for this, we randomly sampled 150 examples from each of our uh, four data sets. And then we take the output for each of those um, from our three data tuner systems, from um, the the prior work and um, one of the human written target outputs. So uh, let me show you an example of that task. So this is what the, the task um, looks like. Uh, if you had been one of the people doing our annotation, this is what you would have seen. So as you can see here, we've got um, the five texts. So from, from those different approaches and we're presenting them all together. So um, these are all generated for the same data input. Um, and these, these um, what looks like sliders there have, have seven points on a, on a Likert scale um, for uh, the annotator to indicate how fluent they are. And just to note on how we're um, presenting this task, um, there's been some, some interesting and, and helpful research around about how to get informative annotations of um, uh, comparing systems. Um, 
by um, Novikova and colleagues in, in 2018 and Van der Lee in, in 2019 that have recommendations about um, this sort of thing. Um, for example, that using continuous scales and, and Likert scales it is, um, tends to get more informative annotation results. And also that um, presenting the text together like this um, can be helpful for comparing systems so that the same person evaluates um, all five texts for, for the particular input. Um, and that tends to give a more informative indication than say if we um, passed one text to one person who says, I think that one's a three and somebody else says, I think that one's a three and kind of don't have a, um, a, a great sense of, of what a three means. But if they look at them together, we have a, a relative um, uh, ranking for them. So uh, these fluency annotations give us results that look a bit like this. So on these uh, average fluency ratings, um, we can see that, that data tuner has higher, um, significantly higher fluency um, compared to the prior work across the four data sets. And here's an example of, um, of that. So this is a, a, um, a cherry picked example where the, um, the text at the bottom here um, contains all of the elements of the meaning um, but as you can see, it not being fluent makes it difficult to use it in practice. Um, in, in an application, um, just conveying the content um, with, with a low fluency can, can make it effectively um, not usable. An interesting finding that you, that you may have spotted while these numbers were up there um, was that the data tuner generated text was evaluated to be significantly better than human written texts um, significantly for, for two of the data sets, statistically significantly, um, which was a, an interesting thing to see. And um, we, we had a look into what was going on there. Uh, and it seems to be that the model uh, was generating more common uh, formulations of, of the text um, compared to sometimes humans using um, perhaps more idiomatic or informal um, ways of, of, um, of stating the data that other people judge to be less fluent. So uh, there's an example of that here. And um, so this one is from the E to E data set, which is about restaurant uh, recommendations. Um, and this is the data tuner, tuner example there and the one that a, a human wrote uh, for this data set. And they have said um, pub in Riverside that also says Italian food, the vaults has got high prices and, and so on. Um, so the, perhaps a, a, a less common phrasing, um, but uh, uh, one that uh, another human didn't, didn't judge to be um, such a good, a good way of expressing this um, fluently. So in some ways that, that could be an advantage for a data to text system um, if we can train with data that has varieties been written by different people um, and the model um, tends to converge on, on the majority forms, the structures that are more common um, and, and perhaps will be um, more likely to be understood by um, a variety of, of users of the system. Uh, next, let me talk a bit about the um, crowdsourced evaluation we have of the semantic fidelity uh, that I mentioned I was going to come back to. Um, so here again we do a comparative experiment and um, crowdsourcing evaluations of the same 150 um, randomly sampled uh, cases that we had. And so we're asking here the annotators to judge whether the text that was generated by the model accurately reflects all and only the content of the original human written text. And here's what that looks like. Um, so that's the original text at the top there is one that was written by a human. And then we have um, randomly ordered the, uh, the outputs from, from different approaches at the bottom. And we opted to keep this as simple. Um, is it accurate or inaccurate? Um, if it's accurate, uh, that means it conveys all of the factual information. Nothing's missing, nothing's added, nothing's repeated. Um, and we also ask the annotators um, in, in the uh, uh, guidance for this task and um, that they should ignore grammar quality or style differences um, and, and concentrate on whether the meaning is the same. 
And as you can see with, with this example, um, some of the texts in, in these uh, data sets that are recommendations have um, uh, uh, this sort of opinion aspect. Um, and so we ask the annotators to, to consider the sentiment and um, whether the sentiment is the same um, rather than the, the kind of specifics. Um, so for example, um, saying what is it that you find so great rather than what is it that makes you love them so much and um, has, has the same sentiment. And um, so uh, that, that would be um, still acceptable. Uh, so here are um, the results from this part. So um, these are the, the percentage that are accurate here. And uh, this is highlighting uh, in yellow here and that our, our best model, the one with the fidelity classifier and with the fine grained state embeddings um, provides a significant improvement um, over the state of the art um, on for semantic fidelity and um, statistically significant uh, on, on three out of four of them. Um, which is interesting also comparing with the automated metrics, as I mentioned, they don't always correlate very well um, with, with human judgments. And in the web NLG uh, data set, um, they, there was quite a small difference between um, data tuner FC and the Castro Ferrero and colleagues uh, approaches in the blue score. Um, but here we see that there is a, a quite a big difference from when humans are uh, evaluating these. And when we looked into that, um, we saw that some of that um, seemed to be in cases where the um, uh, Castro Ferreira uh, model, uh, their, their approach sometimes failed to realize a particular word. So it, it generated a text that had like entity one or, or entity two in it. Like entity one is made with patient two, um, which is something that the automated metrics weren't capturing very well, um, but that humans uh, identified as being not, not conveying the content um, of the original um, human written sentence. We also, um, alongside that, that crowdsource semantic fidelity evaluation, um, we also did some expert uh, evaluations where uh, expert here means uh, me and Hamza, um, so we did some annotations that were um, to assess the quality of the semantic fidelity classifier and compare it to heuristic based um, approaches for, for checking semantic accuracy. Um, and, and I'll show one of those heuristic um, uh, approaches in a moment. So for this, um, we sampled 24 texts from each of the data sets. Um, quite some, some thought went into that, that sampling methodology and, and you can um, read about the detail of it in the paper if you're interested. Um, but uh, broadly to say that we were striving here to have a balance of examples that our data tuner classifier thought were accurate or inaccurate and um, examples that the heuristic approaches thought were accurate or inaccurate. And so having uh, annotated these, what we're trying to um, calculate here is um, the percentage of cases where uh, the experts agree with the label that data tuner gave the generated text um, and uh, how often the experts agree with the uh, label from the, the heuristic approach. And these are the works that we um, took those heuristics from, so um, a different one for, for each of the data sets. And um, we didn't have one for uh, LDC that we were aware of. So here uh, is, is a, a snippet of what these heuristic based semantic checks look like. So this is back on the um, E2E data set for, for restaurant uh, recommendations. And one of the, the possible um, attributes that can be, can be included in the data is whether or not it's family friendly. And this is the um, heuristic, heuristics for checking whether or not the text has, that's been generated expresses um, family friendly. Uh, yes or family friendly no. So for example, um, there's a version here that says um, uh, not family oriented or for adults only uh, as, a, as a way of expressing that the family friendly is no or family friendly yes could be um, it's a place to bring the whole family or, or, or um, child friendly. So as you can see from, from these, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, effort and um, imagination and creativity required to create these to cover the, the, the possible variants of how you could express, express this, um, this content. And so especially if we want to generate a large variety of, of data types, um, of, and especially if we want to go into different languages, it, it's difficult to write this sort of thing um, 
well and comprehensively to cover to cover all, all possibilities. And I'm sure that, that while this has been up, some of you will have um, spotted other valid phrasings that, that aren't captured here. And um, so uh, when I was looking at this earlier, I, I noticed that you could say this one isn't well suited to kids and um, or your children will love it too and um, to, to express this but the heuristics wouldn't wouldn't capture that so would be um, uh, likely to 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 rate that test text as inaccurate even though it does express um, what it was supposed to so all of that's to say that if our automated method and um, this semantic fidelity classifier can uh, reflect semantic accuracy well that that would be great uh, so here's what the uh, expert annotation task looks like and um, so uh, differently from the crowdsourced one um, here we're presenting the meaning representation since we're familiar with that that format and that means we've also got the human um, uh, text as one of the ones to evaluate and similarly we, we uh, turn this into a binary accurate inaccurate and um, so uh, we will compare it to the uh, data tuner outputs of, of just all of the inaccurate ones bucketed together and accurate. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a second to, to do that task yourself um, if, if you want to, to see uh, what, what's involved here. So um, for example, we can see um, in the first one that the death place of the United States uh, isn't mentioned, so that should be um, inaccurate. Um, the next two are the same. They both miss out um, the part about New Mexico. So um, those aren't accurate. Um, fourth one looks pretty good. And the fifth one has missed out um, Staten Island and New York. So um, that's, the, that's the evaluation uh, that we're doing here. And here are the results from that. So um, here we, we're um, averaging the um, QD and QH metrics per data set. So what this means, uh, if we take, say, the web energy uh, row here. So our expert consensus uh, agrees with data tuners classification 87.5% of the time um, and agrees with the heuristics 73.3% uh, of the time. So as you can see there, um, the, the data tuner uh, assessment um, is more accurate and is, it's higher in all of the data sets where we could compute both of those. And that's a significant difference in, in two of them. So that's indicating that you could um, replace these heuristic methods um, with the semantic fidelity classifier um, for, for a higher quality assessment of whether or not um, the text is accurate. Uh, here's an example of that. Um, so this is an example where the heuristics don't capture um, that the M-rated part um, is conveying this um, ESRB, the, the rating of, of M for mature. Um, whereas Data Tuner has learned from um, the, the training data that um, M-rated is, is a valid way of um, expressing this uh, for mature uh, property. And a second example here, this is an example um, of uh, what we can call here uh, a hallucination. So the, the data here makes no reference to rainbow vegetarian cafe. And um, that's something that has been hallucinated by the approach and it's been added in. Um, and the heuristics fail to capture that. It's a challenge for heuristics to, to capture hallucination areas because they, they could be a, a, anything of a huge variety um, it, and tend to be better at capturing emissions data that, that wasn't expressed in the text. Um, but data tuner here has uh, correctly identified that this is an inaccurate um, text. Uh, so with that, uh, let me come to this summary uh, here. And um, that's about what we're going to cover today. So um, to conclude, um, we've shown that an end-to-end an -end approach to data to text generation can improve over pipeline approaches um, in, in fluency and in accuracy of the content conveyed and also shown that um, this model-based assessment of semantic fidelity can um, outperform heuristic-based uh, assessment um, and so is, is a viable alternative uh, to the heuristics. 
uh, here, are, here are some of the references. Um, if you uh, check our paper, you'll find the references to, to, that we've mentioned here, um, or there's a summary blog, um, and our code to reproduce this is available on GitHub too.